Thanks for listening to this teaching from City of Life Church. Check out www.col.tv for more great teachings, service times, and information on upcoming events. Now, let's join the service already in progress. This is a day, a week after Easter, that represents newness of life. With your hands in the air, can you just take a second and remember what God brought you out of? Who can remember right now what God brought you out of? We should never get to a place in our life where we feel that we have things figured out and there are so many people out there that are worse than we are. That's why Paul, as much of a revelation as he received from the Holy Spirit about faith and Christianity and Jesus, he called himself the chief of sinners. It's only when we realize the level and the degree of our sinfulness that we can appreciate the degree of God's grace. So today, in this moment with our hands lifted, aren't you thankful that we're not who we used to be? And aren't you thankful today that we're not who we would have been unless the Holy Spirit would have stepped in on our behalf? I'm thankful for who I'm not today. I easily could have been something else, someone else, but his love stepped in and intervened for me. And today we live in that grace. Holy Spirit, move in this place today to help us appreciate exactly who you are to us and who you're calling us to be, the people that you're calling us to be collectively as a church. Here in Central Florida, we have a part to play, God the way you're shaping this city. But we have a vital part to play. The way we represent you as city of lifers who make the hope of Jesus known in everything we do, the way that we represent you is pivotal in the way you're building this city. And I believe that we are a light to the world, God. Lord, so today let us take this responsibility to heart, to live in a way that honors you in everything we do. And let this be a day of true life change from the inside out, in Jesus' name. And everybody in this place, say it. Come on, say amen. 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 Let's give God a great praise today. Come on, look at a few people around you and say props to you for coming to church the week after Easter. Tell somebody, props to you. As you're having a seat, we want to welcome everyone that is watching online. Got to welcome our Dr. Phillips campus in the first service. Uh, Today is week number two of Dr. Phillips. We had over 100 people at our brand new campus last week for our launch. Come on, I think that deserves a big clap. Our team over there is so excited. And by the way, this is something you should definitely clap for. We had over 700 salvations at all of our campuses combined last week on Easter. Come on, that's, that should be a bigger clap than that. 700 salvations. That is extraordinary. People coming to know Jesus all over the place, all over the world. We're appreciative for... Uh, you inviting people, bringing people, coming yourself. And I'm excited about today because today is something that we've only done a couple of times. I think Pastor Amy and I have been uh, serving as, as the senior pastors here for almost 14 years. This, this will be the 14th year. And I think we've only done this particular type of service twice. So today is a day that we're going to dig in to the concept of baptism. What bas- baptism represents for us as Christians Um, I think sometimes we check out a little bit when we talk about baptism if we have been baptized or we think that we know kind of, you know, I've already been down that road. We don't celebrate baptism enough. Baptism should never, ever be a thing. If we get the opportunity to see another Christian baptized, we should put everything on pause. Baptism for us, especially if we're sports fans and we cheer, at people we don't know crossing imaginary lines. Uh, We should cheer for real when we see Christians that are baptized. Baptism represents people doing away with the old life, stepping into a new life with God. And if, if it's happened to us before, like, well, that's already happened to me. It should be something that reinvigorates our faith, even though we're not getting in there ourselves again. We should be reminded of the significance of what it means for our life. So today, I'm gonna answer some questions about baptism. 
I'm gonna talk about the spiritual significance of baptism. We'll talk about why some churches and some denominations baptize infants, why we don't at City of Life. Uh, from, from a theological standpoint, the symbolism uh, of what baptism is, that baptism is a symbol, it's also a seal. Uh, there's several different examples that we can use of ceremonies, I'm gonna get into those in a minute, and how we can find parallels between baptism, what our relationship with Jesus looks like. But uh, I'm gonna just start it off, by the way, this is for all of us today, and, and good news never gets old, does it? Uh, so this is good news, baptism is good news, and we should never get tired of hearing good news. So my text, two of them today, one is Mark 16, 16, and the reason I'm using this is my first one, it's short, but Jesus said it, it's not something that should be ignored, it's, he said this, whoever believes, let's see, oh, it's not up there, whoever believes, Mark 16, 16, oh, it is up there, whoever believes, read that next part with me, and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. I would just take a moment there and really think about that. Because it's, it doesn't just say whoever believes will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. That would be a little more equal. But it, it says whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. Now, you may say to me, well, Pastor Jeff, do you think you have to be baptized to be saved? Well, I think it's important enough to weigh the concept of what Jesus is saying. I think what he's saying is that Believing is an internal thing. Baptism is an external thing. What he is saying is it's important to have faith and to have some works that represent the faith that you have. You say, oh, well, the, the thief on the cross didn't get baptized. He was nailed to a cross. He literally, he literally could not be baptized. That is the most extreme example imaginable on why you shouldn't be baptized. It is really, I, I think that if you can be saved without baptism, I do think it is possible because I do think there are some people who simply cannot be baptized. I think in those cases, of course, God, man looks on the outward appearance, God looks on the heart. But I think if it is, if, unless there's something crazy that's going on that is keeping you from being baptized, based on that scripture alone, if Jesus Christ is saying to me, you must be saved, you must believe and be baptized. I'm gonna tell you, homie, I'm getting baptized. That means that Jesus said it, and I'm going to do it. So that's a powerful scripture. And then the next scripture we're gonna look at, kind of a long scripture. I'm gonna talk about some of this as I'm reading our text. Then we'll jump into the, uh, the, the teaching in, in depth. But Romans 6, 1 through 14, this is Paul talking. He says, what shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? Great question. Basically what he's saying is when you understand the concept of grace, that it's limitless, he's saying, so should we explore the boundaries of it and just keep doing stupid things because God's grace is so big? He says, absolutely not, by no means. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Look at the person next to you and say, I'm glad I'm sitting next to you. Say, you look great. Say, you're dead to sin and so am I. He says, we have died to our sins. Somebody say, I am dead to sin. The old life that you used to live before Jesus does not apply to you any longer. Last week when we talked about the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ, Jesus died for you, for your sins, and took your sins to the grave. Your sins were buried with Christ. He says in verse three, or don't you? Know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death. So he's saying there's a spiritual baptism that takes place before the physical one. And we're baptized into the death of Jesus, meaning the identity that we had before we knew Christ does not apply to us any longer. Our sins were crucified with Christ. All of our proclivities, all of our preferences, all the things that used to identify us, whether you slept around or had confusion about your sexuality, or you lied, or you cheated, or you were addicted, or whatever, none of that applies to you when you come to Christ. You are dead to sin because Christ took those sins to the cross, and they were buried with him. That's exactly what Paul is saying. 
He says, we were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of God the Father, we too may have and live a new life. Someone should say amen to that. For if we have been united with him in death, like he is, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his, praise the Lord. For we know that our old self was crucified with him. Put your hand on your heart and say, I was crucified with Christ. It goes on to say here, so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. Say out loud, say, I need to stop being a slave to sin. Do you get it that you're going to be owned by one of two things? You say, nobody owns me. Well, you sound like a slave of sin. You you only have two choices. You are going to be owned by something. You are either owned by sin or you are owned by Christ. You don't, there is no third option. So what the Bible is telling us here through Paul's teaching is that there's only two options. Either you belong to sin and you serve for and work for sin. That's why when the Bible says, help me finish this if you know it, the wages of sin is what? The wages of sin, say it one more time, the wages of sin is what? Well, what that means is when I work for someone, they pay me. So that literally means you're working for sin. So sin is your boss. Sin tells you what to do. He pays your paycheck. You belong to sin. But when you get redeemed by Christ and you put your faith in Christ, that is broken forever. But the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus. Jesus doesn't pay wages. He gives gifts. And I would rather receive a gift from Jesus than a payment from sin. So this is just teaching us in every possible way that we are dead to sin forever. Sin has no grip on us anymore because anyone, verse seven says, who has died has been set free from sin. Somebody say, I've been set free. Can you imagine being in prison? Imagine being in prison. Anyone ever seen the Shawshank Redemption? It's a phenomenal movie. Uh, There's a part in the Shawshank Redemption where One of the main characters, if you've never seen, I won't tell you who, but one of the main characters at the end of the movie is no longer in prison, but he can't sleep in a bed and because the bed is too soft. He has learned how to think and live and operate like a prisoner. So he sleeps on the floor so that he can get the feeling that he had when he was in prison. Do you know that we do that with our freedom in Christ? Rather than live in the freedom of God, we go back and imprison ourselves in an old way of thinking or an old way of living, and we make ourselves, again, slaves to sin rather than living free in Christ. Look at someone next to you. Say, stop sleeping on the floor. Say, get in that comfortable bed. Say, and buy you some down pillows, too. Let somebody know, buy you some down pillow. You got to have that, too. That's simple. We could debate about that, but I know you got to get some soft pillows. That helps. So it says, now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we also will live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. This is once again talking about master-slave relationships. May not sound politically correct, This is the Bible, so I don't really care what people think about what's politically correct or not. The Bible is the one that talks about these kinds of relationships. It's saying that uh, slavery, real slavery, is when sin owns you and you work for slavery. So it's saying that he died once and for all for sin, but the life he lives, he lives to God. In the same way, count yourself dead to sin but alive to God in Christ Jesus. You say, this sounds like it's saying the same thing over and over. It is, because it wants you to understand and for me to understand. It says, therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body. What is reigning? Anybody ever had like somebody tell you what to do that didn't have the authority to tell you to do it? 
They tell you to do something and I got news for you, cut it off quick. Because if you let somebody boss you around and tell you what to do when they don't have the right, they'll keep doing it and keep doing it until you put your foot down and say, hey, no, you, you can't tell me what to do. This is not your area. Who are you? Why do you keep following me around telling me what to do? That's what sin does. Sin tries to be your master when it has no authority over your life. Sin has no authority over your life. Look at someone next to you and say, tell sin what to do. Come on, look at the person on the other side. Say, tell sin where to go. I'm not going to use the phrase of what, what it should do. That'd be an old school preacher phrase, like where you're allowed to cuss one time in church if you're doing it the right way. No, I'm not going to do that. But sin, sin should absolutely go where it belongs. It does not belong telling you what to do in your life. You are a child of God that has been redeemed. You need to tell sin that it has no power over you. So don't let it rule and reign in your mortal body and in your desires. Don't obey its evil desires. Don't offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of weakness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer every part of yourself to him as an instrument of righteousness. Somebody say every part. I think it's important that we realize that things that used to be broken in sin that were in our life that remind us of the past, we have to cut off those memories because our lives, just as we are when we come to Christ, are redeemed for God's purposes and everything that we have, we're going to use for his glory. Amen? For sin, it keeps going. It says, for sin shall no longer be your master because you are not under the law but you are under grace. I'm going to talk to you for the remainder of our time before we get into these amazing baptisms. And by the way, lives are going to be changed in this room today. This is going to be an incredible service. I cannot wait. Before we even get to the end of the service, I'm going to tell you something. Don't leave when we start baptizing people. Christians, we should stay till the end. We should celebrate. We should clap. If you've ever clapped for a sporting event or a concert, this is the day that you should be celebrating people that are getting in here, giving their lives to the Lord and committing their futures to God. So I'm going to talk to you for the rest of the time. Saturate on the subject of saturate. So Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for what you're doing in our church. Bless the remainder of this time. Help us get a great revelation of what baptism means for us. Let us live baptized lives by the power of the Holy Spirit in everything we do. In Jesus' name, and everybody said Amen. Do you guys, uh, anyone here like game shows? Did you ever, did anyone like grow up watching game shows? I used to love game shows. Anybody remember a very old game show called uh, The Dating Game? That was, a, that was a crazy show. Was that, is that the one that was, oh no, Love Connection was hosted by Chuck Woolery. The Dating Game was like this game where you, you went on and you have all these people behind a wall and you're talking. Like in normal games, you go on, you go on to win money. In this one, you win kind of like a person. You know, so it's like, it's like, like your, your, your prize, you get to go on a date with someone. That's a good game. I love Family Feud. Anyone remember the old school Family Feud with Richard Dawson? Are you older? Raise your hand if you remember who Richard Dawson. This guy, this is a long time ago. Uh, Richard Dawson was great. He asked a question one time on Family Feud. I thought it was funny. You know in the last, at the end part where you're, you're, you, you have to answer like the 10 questions in a row? He asked this one lady, he goes, what is the month of pregnancy that women begin to show the most? And the lady said, September. I thought that was a, that was a hilarious. That was a very, very funny answer. Uh, family, family, but then uh, a game that I thought was great. I don't think is on TV anymore. That's just really, really good. Is the game called Let's Make a Deal? Do you guys remember that game? Let's Make a Deal was great. There was something really cool about that game. Is people would show up to the the, the game show to the studios wearing costumes. You just wore whatever costume you wanted. And they picked people out of the audience that they thought had the best costume. I guess they had producers that were searching for like the cutest costumes or the most creative costumes. A little piece of City of Life trivia that you may not know. My gorgeous, beautiful, sweet wife, when she was a little girl, was on Let's Make a Deal. She was dressed as a bunny. <laughs> she showed up as a bunny, and it just absolutely won the hearts of the producers over. They came over, and they put her on the show. And did you know that Pastor Amy won an Atari uh, video game system? And she won, huh? Oh, yeah, well, it shows your age. I wasn't going to mention that. She won, she won an Atari, won, a, won an Atari, but also won uh, Mounds candy bars for life. 
A lifetime supply of mounds. I think she deserves a big hand for that. That's pretty big. That's pretty big. Let's make a deal. But the reason that show was actually, besides the trivial fact there that's, that's adorable, the reason that's such a great show is that on that show, the host, wasn't it Monty Hall? Wasn't his name Monty Hall? Uh, would come up and he would give, he would offer you money if you made it up. He would say, here is $500 cash. Then he would say, or you can take what's behind door number one, door number two, or door number three. And you had to make a choice at that moment. Do I want this $500 or do I want to take a risk that if I open door number one, there might be something better there, like, you know, a brand new car. <laughs> yeah, that, that's, that's one of the things that everybody wanted to see. Or maybe if you take the risk and you open it up, there's, it makes that little wah, 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 and there's nothing there. You know, you, you just made a bad choice. But the idea is that you're making a deal. So I remember as a kid, like learning about making deals. And I think that's important that we understand the concept of deals because deals are important in the Bible. Deals are very significant in the Bible. They're called covenants. And we have a covenant relationship with God that is a deal. And the reason deals should be important to us is it teaches, about, it teaches us about character. It teaches us about keeping our word. I think it's very important as Christians that we learn how to be people of our word. And if, if I shake hands with somebody on something, that should mean I'm going to do everything within my power if we've agreed to a deal to keep my end of the bargain. I think that says a lot about us. But in the Bible, deals were on a completely different level. Covenant deals are unbreakable deals that are until death. And there was a process in the Bible that I'm going to explain to you whereby you had to do something that demonstrated how serious the deal was. And we find this when God is giving the promise to Abram, Abraham, before he, God changed his name to Abraham, he was called Abram. But when God was giving the blessing to Abraham and calling him out in Genesis 15, it says, the word of the Lord came to Abram and said, do not be afraid, I'm your shield, your very great reward. Abram said, sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I... Uh, remain childless, and the one who I will inherit my estate is Eleazar of Damascus. And Abram said, you have given me no children, so a servant in my household will be my heir. Then the word of the Lord came to him and said, this man will not be your heir, but a son who is your own flesh and blood will be your heir. He didn't even have a son. He took him outside, said, look up at the sky and count the, scar the, scar the stars, if indeed you can count them. Then he said, so shall your offspring be. Abram believed the Lord, and it was credited to him as righteousness. So that means that God gave him a promise that, yes, you're going to have a son. Yes, you are my man. Yes, I'm going to bless you. Yes, I'm making a covenant with you. You may not see it right now, but I promise you. And Abram believed him, and, and the Bible says that God credited that belief, that faith to Abram as righteousness. That's why D Abraham is mentioned in the book of Hebrews as having great faith because when he believed and trusted God, God saw that as saving faith. He also said to him, I'm the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to take possession of it. But Abram said, Sovereign Lord, how can I know? He says, how can I know that I will gain possession of it? And the Lord said this, and it got really serious. Bring me a heifer, a goat, and a ram, each three years old, along with a dove and a young pigeon. Abram brought all these to him, cut them in two, and arranged the halves opposite each other. The birds, however, he did not cut in half. Then birds of prey came down onto the carcasses, but Abram drove them away. The sun was setting. Abram fell in a deep sleep, and a thick and dreadful darkness came over him. Before I read Verses 17 and 18, please imagine what has just happened. God made a promise to Abraham. Abraham said, God, how can I know it will come true? And God said, make a pathway out of animal carcasses. This is unbelievably bloody. It's gross. There's death involved in it. It's super intense. Abram falls in this like supernatural sleep. It says this darkness came over him. And now look at what happens. He experiences what is called a theophany, 
where God appears in a tangible form to us. Uh, The burning bush would be an example of this. But in this particular case, it says, when the sun had set and darkness had fallen, a smoking fire pot with a blazing torch appeared and passed in between the pieces. So it goes in between this path of carcasses that Abram has laid out. Why is that significant? Because verse 18 says, on that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram. Okay, here's why it's significant. Because this cutting animals in half was the way that you made a covenant that was unbreakable. In that time, by cutting those animals' bodies apart and their death and splitting it in half, both of you that were making the covenant were supposed to walk down the middle of them. And what it meant is if I break the words of this covenant, may what happened to these animals happen to me. But what's crazy about this particular instance, this is even in my book, uh, Jesus First, Jesus Always, I talk about this. What's crazy is that when Abram sees This smoking fire pot, this representation of the glory and the power and the manifestation of God, it shows God going down the middle. Abram doesn't even go down the middle himself. You needed two parties. But what's incredible about this is God was able to go down the middle by himself because he was going down the middle as God, but he was also going through the person of Jesus Christ who was fully human as man and keeping both ends of the covenant himself. Why? Because God knew we would never be able to keep our end of the covenant. So he had to do it through Christ Jesus. And that's what's incredible about covenant, about a deal. A covenant is a deal that I'm going to keep my end of the bargain. Does everyone get that? Okay, so covenants are very valuable. They're very significant in theology. Our covenants with God. Uh, Circumcision, for instance, is an Old Testament covenant that set Uh, the Jews apart from everybody else. And it was so holy, in fact, that when Christianity started growing quickly and Paul got all the revelations that he got, Peter was hanging out with a lot of uh, Christians that were formerly Jews in Jerusalem, and they were sort of getting this mentality, oh, we're better than all of these other Christians that are not circumcised. And Paul and Peter had a huge disagreement. It's one of the only like major disagreements between huge founders of our faith that we find in the Bible. And Paul confronts Peter. He's like, dude, you're whack. He's like, you're crazy if you think you're better than people that have not been circumcised. Jesus came to do something on the inside of it. It's it's no longer about the outside things only. You can use them as symbols, but it's not about that. It's a circumcision of the heart. And he corrected Peter and Peter backed off. So so that's why these covenants are so important. We don't even want to let go of them. Uh, And now we look at John the Baptist that comes on the scene and starts talking about baptism, preaching about baptism, a completely different concept. Some people have been baptized prior to John the Baptist. Normally, it was Jews that were bringing in Gentiles into their religion before Christ came along. It was a ceremonial cleansing of the old life. Now John is preaching a baptism of repentance. So John the Baptist sets the stage for Jesus and, and, and people are getting baptized all over the place. It's a new mentality of repenting for the old life and doing away with the old life through repentance. Then he sees Jesus. He says, behold, the Lamb of God who taketh away the sins of the world. He said, he's so holy that I'm not even worthy to touch his sandals. And someday I'm baptizing with water, but someday he's going to baptize with fire. And Jesus says to John the Baptist, baptize me. That's how important baptism is, is Jesus got baptized. It was at Jesus' baptism when he went down in the water and came back up that a voice came from heaven and said, this is my beloved son and who I am well pleased. Listen to him. And the Bible says that the Holy Spirit descended on Jesus in the form of a dove. Jesus' earthly ministry did not begin until he was baptized. It was at the moment of baptism. So we see the covenant of baptism. There's a covenant there. It's one of the sacraments or sacred things about our Christian faith. Most of our Christian faith is inward. It's what we believe. The Bible does not require us to do a lot of ceremonies or specific things on the outside. It's really about what Christ has done on the inside of us, except for baptism and except for communion. And marriage is another thing that we, you know, is is a very holy, holy, 
a sacred thing uh, for a man born as a man, a woman born as a woman. That is a very holy thing that the Bible says, what God has joined together, let no man separate. So we know that's also very sacred, but not like baptism and communion. These are super important spiritual covenants that we are commanded to do. Is everyone following along today pretty well? I want to make this uh, enjoyable for you, but I also want to, I want to teach you the biblical side of why we do this, why you have been baptized. Uh, so Jesus is buried. Jesus is buried. Jesus is baptized. And when he's baptized, he comes up uh, in the power of the Holy Spirit. Uh, Romans chapter two, verses 28 and 29 says this, for you are not a true Jew because you were born of Jewish parents or because you have gone through the ceremony of circumcision. No, a true Jew is one whose heart is right with God. And true circumcision is not merely obeying the letter of the law. Rather, it's a change of heart produced by the spirit. And a person with a changed heart seeks praise from God, not from people. The reason I think that scripture is very important is I think that's one of the ones that can kind of make room for maybe people who are never able to be baptized to know that they can be saved. Is I think that opens up the door to show us that true circumcision is not physical circumcision. Paul is saying it's circumcision of the heart. When we have been redeemed by Christ, the Holy Spirit sets his mark in us and he seals us. Uh, by the person of the Holy Spirit, and we are set apart for him, that gives us our uniqueness, not some physical trait, okay? But in the same way, we see that baptism is an outward expression of our inward change and our inward commitment toward the Lord Jesus Christ, and it is a covenant. Now, we believe regarding covenants that all covenants have been fully fulfilled in Jesus. We are a product of the fulfilled covenant in Christ. So the, it's important for us to know if we're ever thinking about, like, for instance, why some, some people baptize infants and other people do not baptize infants. I think that's a great question. So pedo-baptist pedo -baptist versus credo-baptist. Pedo meaning children or infants, little kids uh, who, who are not really aware of what they're doing, or credo. Creed means a belief. So credo Baptist means you baptize based on beliefs. At City of Life, we do not baptize infants or people that do not understand baptism simply because we don't believe that is, is a saving element for someone that does not believe. And so, for instance, people that would argue that you should baptize infants would probably use, I think there's four or five references in the New Testament to when people get saved and it says they, their whole household was baptized. If you analyze every one of those and you look at the scriptures that I just mentioned, I think what you will find is that almost all of those households had family members that were old enough to have been converted already through their belief and their baptism was just following along with the belief that they already had. So I think it's really important so if you're saying, if I was baptized as an infant, should I be baptized now as an adult? I believe the answer is absolutely yes. And the reason I think it's important is I think it's important that you're baptized after you come to a saving faith in Christ. After you have put your faith in Christ and you recognize that that old life has been done away with. Now, here's another question. Should I get baptized again? I was baptized as an adult. Well, were you baptized with a full understanding that you were committing your life to Christ? Did you understand what you were doing? Were you still a slave to sin? Did you actually experience a conversion when you were baptized? And, and the way I would kind of explain that would be like, you know, uh, like if, if my wife and I are not having a great time and we're not getting along, I don't think it makes sense for me to go, will you marry me again? You know, like, like, like let's go down to the courthouse and get married again. I'm really sorry that we were arguing uh, should we get, do you think we should get married again after an argument? No, you get married one time. And when you get married, that, that wedding is significant. And it means throughout your life, you were consecrated in the eyes of God as married. Now at my 40 year anniversary or something, if we wanted to go to, you know, I don't know, Cabo or something and, and get, and get married as a sign of 40 great years and invite a small group of people. So our kids can be there. That's wonderful. That's beautiful. That's great. That's fine. If you want to do that, that's fine. But does that make you any more married than you were? No, it just renews the concept. It makes it fresh in your mind again, which by the way, I believe that watching others get baptized 
should renew the concept every time we see it. We don't have to jump in there every single time. Come on, if, if you're here today, we don't have to jump in there every single time. But using the example of marriage, let me give you another idea. Can, if you're married, if you get married to someone and you find out five years into your marriage that when they married you, they were already married to someone else and they didn't tell you about it. Does that make anybody mad in here? You guys are like, oh, that's terrible. <laughs> I'm, I know somebody. I mean, I know somebody well who grew up in Kissimmee. He had like seven brothers and sisters and his dad was married to, an, and he was married to his mom, but was married to another woman that lived one street over that had five kids. Same town. Used to like say he was going on business trips and would sleep in the house like every other night. So this is real stuff that actually happens in people's lives. People are nuts. Look at someone next to you say, don't be loco. <laughs> yeah, don't be crazy. People do crazy things. Okay, so if I was married and I had already been married, that second marriage, you may say, well, it counts. No, it doesn't. It doesn't count if you don't meet the requirements for what marriage is. O openness about who you are, what life looks like. Am I married or not? This is not a real marriage. So in the same kind of way, I think that if you're ever baptized again, it should be for one of the reasons that I mentioned. Either you got baptized at a time where you were not serious about your faith. You didn't know what you were doing. You didn't understand what you were doing. That would be one thing. I think you need a valid baptism of actual faith in Christ. Or I believe it should be a point in your life where I mentioned like the 40 year thing where it's just like a later point in life where you're just doing it. Like I'm just gonna tell you straight up. If I get the opportunity uh, to go to Israel with my parents, my dad's gonna baptize me. I, I wanna get baptized again. I, 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 just, I, I just would love to get baptized in the Dead Sea, I just think it would be just like, like an amazing experience of the Jordan, or it'd just be phenomenal, something historical over there to, to, to like take that memory with me. Uh, so that would not be something that would be expecting that I would be blessed finally. It would just be more something that is like a personal thing. So I think that when it comes to baptism, I hope, I hope you're getting the concepts of what baptism should be. Um, Ceremonies are helpful in helping us understand. Graduation is a ceremony. Graduation represents moving from uh, one level of life to another uh, in life. Baptism is like that in a way. It's like graduating from one life to another. Uh, the, a life of sin to a life in Christ. Weddings are the same way. Baby dedications. For us at City of Life, we're not baptizing babies. We don't believe they understand or have saving faith. If you were baptized as a child and you have a denomination that you grew up with, I'm not criticizing the de denomination. They're great. You know, it's, it's fine. It's, I understand what they're doing. But I'm just saying that that's not what we believe theologically here. So here we dedicate children and we say that this is more of a, a ceremonial thing where our families are saying our child belongs to God. They do not belong to us. We're going to raise them in the fear and the admonition of the Lord. Does everyone understand that? So ceremonies are about transitions. So is baptism. Baptism is a ceremony. It's a transition. It's a symbol. But it's not just symbolic. It's also a seal. So a seal is something that is official. It is the seal of the Holy Spirit in your life. That's why we're commanded to do it. And, and I just think that we need examples of things that open up our understanding to a greater revelation of what that thing is. When I got engaged to my wife, uh, we had been dating for a few years, but I came up with this whole entire idea of the way that I wanted our engagement to go. I took her to Captiva Island. We drove over there. Drove over there. We had uh, lunch at our favorite restaurant. I hung out, and I wanted to take her to the beach just as the sun was setting. There's a place there called Pine Island Sound where that particular body of water meets the Gulf of Mexico at a specific spot where the two come together, and there's no longer one body of water and another, but they're both mixed together, and the two become one. This was my idea. See, y'all didn't know I had that riz, did you? I tell you, I, I keep that in my back pocket, just in case. Everyone, you got to keep it somewhere, you know what I'm saying? Anyways, so uh, anyways, <laughs> I took her there, and, and I said, I, you know, I got down on my knee in the water. I said, hey, you know, this is Pine Island Sound, and this place, you know, the water comes in here, and this is the Gulf of Mexico, and the two come to one, and 
in the same kind of way. I don't want to live two separate lives. I want our lives to be one thing and be covered by the blood of Jesus. She was like, oh, oh, oh. yes. I'm like, I didn't even ask yet. I, 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 no, I'm kidding. I, that didn't happen. I didn't happen. I'm joking. It was beautiful. That was the best day of my life. I made a great decision. Uh, but, but truly, uh, that idea of two becoming one has challenged me in our relationship when I look at my life and I'm operating as one. I'm not fulfilling the very example that I gave my wife in the illustration. I don't wanna be two separate entities, I wanna be one. So examples can help remind us of how we should get back on track. Baptism is the same way. Baptism is an example of being dead to sin and being alive to Christ. Baptism is a public declaration that you identify with the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. Put your hand on your heart. Say, baptism is a public declaration that I identify with the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Amen. Hey, we die with him in, bapti- in, ba- in baptism. Galatians 2.20 said, I've been crucified with Christ. I don't know if any of y'all, if y'all remember that old City of Life album from like 16 year, 15 years ago uh, that had fire on it. There was a song on there called I'm Changed. And the lyrics to I'm Changed, it starts out, it says, there's a dead man in the grave beneath my name. It reminds me of the day my life was changed. Now it is not I, but it is Christ who lives in me. Basically what that means is I'm looking at a tombstone that says my name on it. That's the old me. I have a brand new me that's resurrected in Christ from now on forevermore. It, my, my old life doesn't belong. So we, have, we die with him. We are buried with him. And we are resurrected with him in baptism. 1 Peter 1.3 says, Blessed be God the Father the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to his great mercy, has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So I hope you understand the concept today of what baptism is. If you're here today, you've never given your heart to Jesus, I'm gonna pray a prayer in just a moment. I'm gonna ask you to put your faith in Jesus. And if you are here and you have been baptized when you were so young that you didn't understand it, or maybe you have never... Or maybe you thought you understood it or you were just married to someone else spiritually. (laughs) You never were really wanting to give your heart to God. You weren't wanting to commit your life to Christ. Today is a day to make a public declaration that you identify with the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ. We're gonna have a moment here after I pray where I'm gonna invite you up, those people that want to be baptized, and we're gonna stand here and celebrate, and you're like, I was gonna go to Red Lobster and get those cheese biscuits while they hot. It'll be open later. Today, we ain't going to try to get to the parking lot and get out of here quick. We're going to celebrate the people that have just given their hearts to Jesus and are going to get saved. And we're going to cheer and we're going to clap and we're going to lean in and we're going to walk a little closer and we're going to look up on the screens and we're going to cry and we're going to remember where we were when God saved us. And this is going to be something that makes our faith stronger than ever before. If you're questioning, should I do it? The answer is yes. If the Holy Spirit is pushing you toward it, yes, you should. You say, well, am I going to get wet? You can't get baptized unless you get wet. That's the whole point of getting baptized. We got towels up here. You're like, well, these clothes, they don't, they're not going to look very flattering when you get baptized. Who cares? It does, none of that matters. All that, no, it's not ideal. We got concrete floor. Nothing is ideal. But in the Bible, when someone needed to get baptized, they got baptized where they were. They didn't wait and go invite all their family members. They did it at the moment because the Spirit of God was moving on them in that moment. So today is a moment where the Spirit of God is moving in this place. So every head bowed, every eye closed. If you're here and you do not know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you never put your faith in Christ. I'm going to ask you all this room, nobody looking around, every head bowed, every eye closed. If you need Jesus to be the Lord of your life, I'm going to count to three. When I do, I'm going to ask you to put your hand in the air. If you're watching online, I'll ask you to type in the chat, I need Jesus. Type in the chat, I'm lifting my hand so our moderators can see and connect with you. I believe there's power in this moment. Here we go. On three, I'm going to ask you to lift your hand. One, the Bible says now is the time of salvation. Two, I believe every person in this room has been drawn here by the power of the Holy Spirit for this very moment. Three, hands in the air all over this building. Hands going up in every section. Oh my gosh, that's so many people lifting their hands today. Truly, truly incredible. I'll ask you to pray this prayer out loud. Say, I ask you, Lord, 
to forgive me of my sins. I identify with your death, your burial, and your resurrection. You took my sin to the cross and to the grave and were resurrected so I could be dead to sin and alive to you forevermore. Thank you, Jesus. I serve you from this day forward in Jesus' name. Come on, somebody say amen and give God a great praise. Come on, if you want to get baptized, come down. The Lord loves you. He wants you. He desires you. Come on, let's worship. Everyone else, let's lift our hands. Let's honor our Jesus.
miss your opportunity to be baptized. We're gonna stay a little longer. If you have to go, you can be dismissed. But if it's still on your heart to be baptized, if you're in the room right now and you're feeling stirred, you're feeling convicted, we invite you to come to the front of the room right now. We're not gonna end service just yet, but if you have to go, you can head out the back doors, pick up your city kids over in David Hall. We love you, church family. For those that are staying, we're gonna continue to worship. We're gonna continue to celebrate those being baptized. Come on, church, let's continue to sing.
anybody who wants to get baptized gets baptized today. God's moving in this room today. Host team, help us get guests over here who need to be baptized. And then we also just want to kindly remind you, we do have concrete floors, so please make sure to exit out the side doors, quickly out the side doors. There we go. Awesome. We're going to continue to worship just a little bit longer before we conclude our service today.
This concludes the teaching. If you'd like to support what God is doing here at City of Life, click on the Give button at www.col.tv or text a dollar amount to the number 855-997-6900. We hope you'll join us again.